that all are hunting chill and took the time to join. We write you for zooming in on sustainability. This year, the Queen Quet head from the body of the Gullah Geechee Nation. And I'm so glad that I'm going to chill in the joint for this year thing when we would crack we teeth, but we're going to just see the snow, sea level rise. And of course, since the Gullah Geechee Nation, the in Atlantic Ocean, from Jacksonville, North Skakalaki to Jacksonville, Florida, we have a study this year kind of thing. And we're so glad that we had this year opportunity for do this year today with the guests that we got upon you from one of we Gullah Geechee Sustainability and Think Tank member organizations, Climate Central. But before we go on into bringing him on screen, let we go ahead and get started with we moment of silence. So if Hunter would, please just take a moment of silence for all the family and thing of the lost people in some of these flooding that we've had on the coast over all these generations. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. So we're so glad that all the hundred chillin' there ya with we. So we are going to talk about rising to the occasion of fighting back against what people call climate change and doing that through climate science, right? I know that y'all would say, well, you shouldn't have to say that, but I do. Because unfortunately, in the world that we are in now, science, education, these types of things are not seen as the thing to rise to the occasion of now. We have people in leadership, I use that word loosely for lack of a better term, but elected is what I prefer to say, positions where they actually can command whether there are resources that come into communities or resources that stay away from communities. And unfortunately, for people who look like me, who come from communities like mine, that people now call BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Colors communities, we're not unaccustomed to people not rising to the occasion of funding the things that are needed to protect our communities. Well, because we live in the Sea Islands, we live right here on the Sea Islands, we live in the Gullah Geechee Nation, people want this view that I have up here. Wouldn't you? I love the view. But my cultural community goes to that view. We don't want that view coming to us. And unfortunately, for almost a decade now, we have dealt with seeing that view get closer and closer and closer to us. For two decades, we've been saying there's something wrong. There's something that's changing. And people wouldn't listen. You know, when you mentioned, well, there's damage at the beach. We could see it along the creek shores. They were like, oh, it's just erosion. I mean, that happens. That's just what happens naturally. The sand shifts, it moves to different places. We get that. We know that sea islands are created because of the movement of sand, the movement and the changes with water levels. We get that. We get that the maritime forest and the marsh, the oyster beds and all of it is part of coastal ecology. And when we brought that up and said, don't build everywhere, because of that, we were then told we were the emotional natives. That is a real quote, the emotional natives. Now, for many of you who might be tuning into this broadcast for the very first time, hearing that I'm the chief and head of state for the Gullah Geechee Nation, I wanted to yet me to crack my teeth like a dish or anything like that, you would just say, well, okay, yeah, she is a native, I am, but I'm also a native scientist. I'm actually a computer scientist that studied engineering, okay? I'm a person who has had to do some of the most complex forms of math that exist because I'm also a mathematician in order to determine the possibilities of certain things. So statistics, I get them. Numbers, I get them. And when someone tells me the numbers of how high the water's going, is going up like this, I don't consider that complex math. I consider that elementary math, that if you tell a child is one foot of water versus five feet of water, they would tell you the five feet is greater than the one, but it's still part of science. It's still part of something that many people don't celebrate because in school, it seems kind of scary. It seems to be the most difficult classes. So a lot of our folks don't want to go into it. And if you are a female like me and a black female, they told you that's not for you. People said, well, women don't normally get into this. When I was studying science, those were the little comments, but I was, I said, well, 
I'm growing to be a woman, so I'll be a woman that's into it. And I'm really into it with computers. That became my world. That became, as I tell people, my drug of choice. When I found out that you could take zeros and ones and make them do the things that maybe it could do much, much faster than you, or just maybe those things you don't want to do at all, <laughs> okay, at times, it's a wonderful thing. It's like the difference between the scrub board and the washing machine, right? Everybody who ever had to scrub their clothes by hand and rinse them by hand and hang them on the line, I think really has a great appreciation for the scientific knowledge that went into creating the washing machine and the electric outlet that you could plug it in and let it do the work for you. Well, I'm sorry to say, we don't have a washing machine for this. We don't have a scientist that can say, okay, God, stop with the water. Don't let it rise. Don't let it come inland. Don't let it do any of that. But sounds to me, seems to me like God might be telling us, y'all stop doing what you're doing and maybe that would change. He would call it being Anthropocene. Humans are creating some of these issues we're faced with by throwing garbage out of our hands, by letting plastics go into the water and things. We are creating an acidic environment in the ocean. Who wants something that we're saying is acidifying to also rise up and end up possibly where your food grows already? Your fish, your shrimps, your oysters, yes, they live and they grow in the water. And we want to see them either in the water swimming or when we bring them in for a meal or pets or the aquarium. We don't want to see them because all of a sudden the water's in your yard, the water's in the street. This is not shark needle. We celebrated shark week last week. That is not real stuff to have sharks and fish flying through the air, but we've all seen different catastrophic events happen. And then things that look apocalyptic happen as well. Like people finding dead fish along roads, people seeing birds fall out the sky. We've seen horrible things happen with this water that clouds how beautiful the view looks, that clouds the way we think about it and what we ought to do with it. But to me, if we think about ourselves, we should automatically think of the water. Here in the Gullah Geechee Nation, we say the water bring me, the water why take me back. But we don't want it to take us under. We want the sea levels not to continue to rise because of something we're doing. But if it does, are we prepared for that? How do we deal with that? If you saw that opening, I'm sure you were stunned by it. I'm sure if you've ever been to Charleston, South Carolina, here in the Gullah Geechee Nation, you recognize the buildings. I'm sure if you're someone who's dealt with weather reports just from even watching the Weather Channel, you know that here in the Gullah Geechee Nation, we live in a hurricane zone. So when we talk about flooding, we not only deal with it with hurricanes like Hugo that we showed you there, but we've dealt with it just with what they call sunny day flooding. We've dealt with it because the sea levels are rising. We've had it come across the causeways that you have to drive your car over because of this thing going from what we used to call spring tide when I was growing up to king tide. Cotton is not king here anymore. The tide is. So if it's going to keep coming in, if God's not going to stop it because we're not stopping what we're doing, we have to be prepared. So the same way with a hurricane in this time of year, we tell you, get your kit together. Most people, especially us country folk, have toolkits. So what's in your toolkit that can help you with sea level rise? Well, I have spent the last few years using this tool that's called Risk Finder to find out what risk is the population of the Gullah Geechee Nation under, and also what risk of property is there in the Gullah Geechee Nation, especially to historic sites, but more so even than those, to people's homes. What about the sacred areas that we do libation ceremonies, where we baptize? What's gonna happen in 10 years? What's gonna happen in 20 years? What's gonna happen possibly way beyond our lifespans? So as a scientist, 
we can start to extrapolate things and we can start to put formulas together that will give us projections that'll say, this is what can happen if these things all come together. All right. And so this tool one day I got to see because I was invited to a meeting and here it was, they introduced this person that worked for a group called Climate Central. So I know some of y'all watch Comedy Central, but this is not a joke. I said, hmm, that's interesting. Interesting name. Wonder what they're going to talk about. And here it was. They, got present, they presented a tool that I took to immediately. It appealed so much to me as a Sea Islander, but even more so as a scientist. And I know as a leader, an elected leader, that science should be valued. Science can be beneficial. And when they started showing me how this tool wasn't just for academics, it wasn't just for scientists, that anybody in any community could put in their zip code, get out what they need, and then download a PDF already created for them, then you know as a computer scientist, I love that, right? It lets, it does what you don't want to do, <laughs> or it does this thing that simplifies the most complex thing for you to print it out and then go into activist mode. Take it downtown, take it to your congressman, take it to your county councils, send it to them now. You can stay in the distance and email these facts to them and say, look what will happen if you don't look at the portion about the population, which they should because they need our votes. If you don't look at that portion, look at this portion of how much real estate can be affected, flooded, destroyed. What does that do to insurance values? What does that do to your tourism value? What does that do to these numbers that you want to add up? that we have these machines adding up all the time, not realizing your greatest machine in your first computer is always the mind. Where are these great minds? They're in your people. They're in your people that live in these communities that are going to be affected and infected because it's a public health crisis when there's too much flooding, when they have to deal with the outcomes of mold and other things because things get wet, go underwater, and then we have it to deal with. So it's better to know ahead of time and have some tools ahead of time that might help us to know better how to plan for the future. So I am so happy to be working with Climate Central on a number of different tools they've come up with. And I had to applaud my guest today, Dan Rizzo, when I gave him homework to say, I love these flyovers y'all have at your site, that you're Washington, D.C., all these great places that are iconic in Philadelphia and all those kind of places. But can we get one for the Gullah Geechee Nation? And when they did the holy city, Charleston, that people know almost the world over, floods, that the battery where the most expensive homes are flood, that many people have been pushed out of the city further inland because they can't afford to continue to deal with flooding, even on a sunny day, that even the market floods. A lot of people have seen those images of people rowing sweetgrass basket type boats through the market, okay, that was photoshopped. All this is a fun way to deal with a very serious issue. And I feel like the climate central tools are some fun things that we can use to engage with students. We can use to engage with groups of people at all different levels of learning because it's gonna take all of us to change our behaviors, to change the real climate and maybe send the water back out where it should be and let it start to lower. And I pray that we have to redo this tool because the numbers will change in the future that the water goes down and not up like we're predicting. But if people don't change their behavior, the tool's gonna be spot on. So let me bring to the forefront, the person who's been behind, dealing with the other zeros and ones and coming up with these wonderful flyovers, coming up with these great examples visually for us to see what could happen 
when the sea levels rise in our zip codes. Dan, how hunted to do today? How thing wine in Princeton? Hi, Queen Quet. First of all, thanks so much for having me on your show. I, I really appreciate your leadership in this field, and it's been an honor to be part of your think tank. Um, so yes, we, I, I'm part of a team at Climate Central. We're a nonprofit research group based in Princeton, and our team of scientists and web developers and other folks uh, were dedicated to getting good science-based information and tools related to sea level rise and coastal flooding into the hands of people who can use them. So I was thrilled that you were able to attend the meeting that we held some time, some years ago, and that we've uh, kept in touch since then. Yes. Yeah, you and I have been taking it on the road until Rona stopped our travels. That's and right. now we have to do things virtually, but it'll be great. And we'll be announcing because Dan and I and what I, who I call the Kates um, are also going to be doing some virtual conferences coming up this fall. And so we'll definitely, if y'all follow us at GullahGeecheeNation.com, follow at Gullah Geechee on Twitter and Instagram. We'll be posting about those so y'all can tune in, you know, sign up and register and be there with us. But we've had a lot of fun, um, Dan. I've enjoyed doing this. So we've had so many different arenas and different types of audiences that we brought this tool to. I mean, everybody from planners to, you know, climate change specialists. I mean, and I know you've done a lot more of these, but Tell us some of what kind of went into the thinking. Why was your nonprofit created to do this? Mm -hmm. And what made y'all come up with tools like Risk Finder? Why that? You could have done anything else as scientists. Why mm -hmm. this particular thing? Yeah, well, we were founded by leaders at Princeton and other universities back in 2008 to be an independent research group to uh, provide kind of independent information about uh, climate impacts. And one of the climate impacts that's most tangible uh, is uh, sea level rise because you, it's, you can localize it. So we're able to provide very localized information uh, using federal data sets. So we're using NOAA's LIDAR elevation data, which is a wonderful data set. And we've um, intersected that with about 100 other data sets from EPA, you know, hazardous waste sites, um, most EPA regulated facilities are in our tool, uh, schools, hospitals, um, uh, population, we have census data in there. So we're able to take very large, um, I think we tackled it because sea level rise was very tangible and we were able to tackle it uh, and, and provide a tool for the entire country, uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 in the coastline anyway, uh, in, in a consistent way. So we're able to take these federal data sets and then localize them down to the zip code and town level, municipal level. Wonderful. So I definitely know folks want to see this now. And I'm glad you mentioned one of what we call the layers in mm. terms of how you all have done this mapping and then been able to do these flyovers and other things is because you have so many data sets coming in. And one of them is census. And you know, <laughs> right now we got to keep encouraging people to fill out the census before they stop taking the numbers, because that will literally impact resources like I talked about at the beginning and also the types of data that go into things like this tool. So would you encourage people to go ahead and get on census.gov and go ahead and fill in their form? Sure, yes. Yeah. Um, census data is important because when it comes out in 2020, we'll have the most accurate uh, Oh, well, in, in the next, in the coming year or so, there'll be an, a new, an updated census data set, and we'll be able to incorporate that into our tools. So as these federal data sets get updated, we can pull them and utilize them. Yeah, and the more accurate the data set, the more accurate your tool. That's right. Right. That's right. And people don't realize when we talk about these data sets, just like census, some of them, they're not taken all the time. So census right. is a 10-year right. block. <laughs> Yeah, but now one of the things that we're we're really interested in here in the Gullah Geechee Nation is the timing of what your tool does. So why don't we take a look at some of the slides? I know you always bring slides. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I'll share my screen here. Yeah. You should have ability to share screen now. Okay, here we go. Great. If y'all wondered who was that voice, that's <laughs> our other teammate that's at the Create Fellowship at University of Minnesota, because they're also part of our Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank. So that was Sister Kylie in the background, if y'all just wondered, wait, we didn't see Queen Quet's mouth moving, and that was a different <laughs> one. That's so <laughs> can, can, 
can you see the search bar here? The yeah, risk finder? Okay. I actually have a couple slides, but I'm just going to type in, you can go to riskfinder.org and you type in any, you know, coastal location that's important to you, a town, a city, a zip code. And then through the drop down menu, you select what's important to you. And we give you a long scrolling page of information about each location. And in that page, you can scroll down to the what is at risk section. And this is where we intersect census data, population data sets, whether it's the overall population or population of color, African American, high social vulnerability population. We have definitions of all these below and their original data sources link, links to those. And you can kind of explore the data sets to see what's important to you. Are you interested in hazardous waste facilities to see what might be contaminated when they flood? Are you interested in roads or rail miles? Are you interested in, you know, as I mentioned, uh, population sets or buildings? Let's say you're interested in schools. You can kind of zoom in. But what you can do on the left side is you can uh, set the water level to different levels based on the flood event that you are uh, anticipating. So let's say you're anticipating a storm coming in with a storm surge of about six feet. You get a, a, an alert from the National Weather Service. You come into our tool, type in your zip code or town, go to that water level and see roughly how many people are living on land that, are, that, that could be at risk. And as you move the water slider, you'll see the numbers on the right side change. And they changed tremendously when you did that from yeah, six that's feet right. down to three feet. That was mm -hmm. a big jump. Yeah. That's right. And so it's a way to kind of um, come in and explore and find out what is important to you and your work. Also, as you mentioned, you can come up here and download a fact sheet. And uh, those fact sheets uh, look like this. So you've got uh, a summary of what's in the tool, what's at risk. It explains how rising seas is raising the launch pad of storms and making them more frequent and damaging. Uh, the, it shows probabilities. So Queen Quite, you like the, the stats that are in here, I'm sure. Yes, uh, no, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got frequently answers to frequently asked questions. So you're able to come into the tool quickly, search for your location, download a fact sheet and bring it with you. And uh, you know, Dan, you didn't know this, but just recently I did climate reality training. Okay. And so one of the things that was our homework was that we had to go and research some particular topics. And so when I did the piece about the sea level rise and it asked us to upload where were we getting our information, I went and got one of these fact sheets and I uploaded it. Oh, great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, so that's Risk Finder. You have a lot of other information in there uh, uh, in terms of when you might expect, uh, which, which sea levels you might expect when. So as the new sea level projections and the new science comes out, we're able to plug those projections in here and you can look at sea level projections through 2200 in some cases, but you can really look at 20, 2030, 2040, 2050, kind of a time span of a mortgage to see how much seas may rise localized to your location. Uh, and then you can think about how much, uh, if you wanna add a mild flood level. So the, the amount of flooding you might expect once per year, you can add that on top and get a sense of what are we looking at here? So here in Charleston, you can get under the hood, but using no as kind of medium scenario in this case, you're looking at uh, you know, two to three feet mid-century and uh, up to, yeah, it could be, oh, this is with the mild flood on top, right? So there's all kinds of different scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, with your and permission, you I'll, I'll go a ahead. Mild flood. Like yep. those of us who live on the sea islands, flood, we just say flooding. It's just flooding. Or yeah. we get these alerts, it just says you have a flood or a surge. Why don't you explain what, first of all, what do you mean by mild flood? And then what's the difference when you say the word surge versus flood? Yeah, so uh, the, 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 first of all, you have tides, right? So our maps show kind of, we're based, basing it off a high tide line. So uh, inundation, uh, uh, I guess um, projections we show are starting, uh, we utilize the, the, the high tide line. And then also um, the annual flood level essentially is a, uh, um, it's the, uh, it's the level of flooding you would expect one time per year, right? So it's, uh, we call it a mild flood because it's frequent, right? And then you could expect something called like a 10 year flood. What, what would you expect in terms of probabilities? what would you expect once every 10 years? And that's a higher level. And then you have the, something that's more familiar to everyone, the 100 year flood, right? The, the FEMA has those 100 year flood zones. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, based on what, um, uh, what, what our peer reviewed science expect, uh, 
uh, calculates to be a, a hundred year flood level. So you have, um, uh, so, so that breaks down the, the flood level types. And then you can add those in our tool to different sea level uh, baselines. Mm -hmm. So in our tool here, I, I'm going to go to Charleston. Yeah. There we go. And in this case, um, we're looking at land projected to be below the annual flood level in 2050. So we're looking at a sea level rise projection of 2050 plus that annual flood level on top. Mm -hmm. And you can you can adjust the water slider to different years, but you can get a you know go under the hood and choose, all right, I want to look at sea level rise plus a 10-year flood, which we call a moderate flood. I see. So right? why don't you take it down to the 2030, since you were showing us in risk finder 2030. Why don't you move yeah, sure. on down from 2050 to 2030 yep. so that the viewers can actually tell something similar and how this is different on this particular map. So That's this right. One, yeah, is at the coastalclimatecentral.org. This Coast, is where yeah. the maps are, yeah. And so that's one of the things you can do in risk finder. You see, all right, what water level I'm interested in. What, what year am I kind of interested in? But this map actually map gives, gives you, for the Everything. first time, the year itself. So we give you the inundation, projected inundation by year. By year. And so mm -hmm. 2030, right? And then you can come in and say, all right, I want to assume I want to look at a, we, we default to an annual flood level because that's okay. the most frequent. Mm -hmm. So you, so this map is anticipating, you know, that the land in red is below, uh, is, is uh, anticipated to be uh, at risk um, oh. by 2030 so as, uh, it, using, um, yeah. So, and then these, these other sliders let you adjust kind of the models that we're using. So you can assume we're going to make moderate cuts, kind of the Paris Agreement uh, cuts yes goals right if you want to assume that will not will not make those you can slide it out here to the unchecked pollution uh, mm -hmm. scenario and then you can compare maps to see the difference of the additional land that's at risk if we don't wow. now so, yeah, the, the bigger get, the bigger divergence blood okay. red increased very quickly you're right and so uh, and then you can choose different sea level rise models down here and you can also choose if you want to incorporate levees uh, that we don't have a we, we don't have a complete levy database in the U.S., but we've incorporated any levies that we could find uh, uh, um, in in the past. There, mm -hmm. And then, um, along with natural ridges that may protect areas, so our maps can show areas that could potentially be protected by levies or natural ridges. And you can choose whether you want to incorporate those or not. Or not, I see. So would you click done so that we can see the sure. full map? Yeah, and yeah. Really, yeah. people can really see that and get a sense of that. If anyone lives in Charleston or has visited Charleston or are considering buying property in Charleston, a lot of people are not aware that the city, the historic peninsula of Charleston, actually a lot of what you see around the marinas is landfill. That was not a natural peninsula all the way around. It was half the size roughly than what it is naturally. And over time it became landfill, 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 then they did building. So we're trying to stop this fill and build thing going on throughout the Gullah Geechee Nation because of this. You can see with the tool, now know more about the emotional natives. Now we have a scientific tool that we could actually show to politicians. You can show to conservation specialists, you can show to others and say, well, look at this. Only in 10 years from now, would you want to build in these places that are red? Any of y'all can write in the chat anytime you feel like, tell me if you think that would be a wise idea to build in any of these places in the red. But now I'm looking here at another group that's part of our think tank and that's MUSC. And the medical, yes, I love when you do that and you change the colors, change how the map does. Mm -hmm. Where MUSC is in some of that red already in 10 years. Some of yeah, the buildings I, are there. Yeah. I can I can scroll around if you want. This, we, we use the Google Maps uh, front end, so you know a lot of the cultural heritage sites that you may care about are probably in Google Maps, right? So you could zoom yes. into those and they'll be here, and you can as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so now this is this is really interesting to me. I'd like you to switch because you know I always like to show the juxtaposition. So why don't you try the two nine nine two zip code? and switch to St. Helena Island 
just so people could see the differentiation between this urbanized space that's the city of Charleston and a more rural space here in the Gullah Geechee Nation and how that looks on a map like this. Because, of course, naturally living on Sea Island, uh, y'all are probably saying, well, y'all, don't y'all do it? St. Helena? Yeah, St. Helena. Uh, South Carolina. Yes. There it is. Got it. Here we go. Yeah. Yep, there we go. That looks more like my home. Now, y'all will see why this is so important to us as Sea Islanders. You see that before the map even finished fully opening, you see how much of it is in the red area. And we're still, go ahead, you put your tool up there. So we're still doing moderate flooding. Was oh, yeah, moderate? sure. Yeah. I was, uh, we're, we're showing unchecked pollution, but we could bring it back to moderate cuts and take a look. Absolutely. Uh, by 2030, the, the, the difference isn't as great as later in time, right? 2050, 2100, but there's still a lot of red there. Yeah, and people want to get the links. Everyone's asking, where's the link? So it's riskfinder.com. You can go to uh, riskfinder.org to, org. to go to the risk finder. Yeah. Now, and then the other tool we have is coastal.climatecentral.org. Yeah. That's our coastal risk training tool. And those of you who signed up today too, if you send us email to the Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition to G-U-L-L-G-E-E-C-O, at AOL.com, we'll add you to our database and we'll also be able to send you some more of these things after the show today. So we'll definitely send out the links again. But if you want to try out the tool while we're on here, go right ahead now to riskfinder.org. That's the first one we started out with. And then we are looking at right now the coastal.climatecentral.org links. I see so my colleague Don has sent some of that information out. Yep, right. he's on here. Yep. Yeah, I see Don. Hi, Don. Great. Glad <laughs> you're here. And I saw Eric from the Think Tank here, too. Glad to see all of y'all today. So, yeah, definitely. This is so you can see the dramatic nature of this. And that's why I loved also the colors that you all chose, the scientists that made it dramatic. <laughs> because people who are not necessarily scientists, sometimes you got to kind of shake them up. And so when people see this red, it's so obvious. You know, and that looks, ooh, that looks really, you know, like a thriller piece. Da, da, da. You want the music with it and everything. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, it looks like it says to people, whoa, is that like a blood spill? And it catches people's mm -hmm. attention, but we don't want people's blood to spill. That's the point. That's why we don't want to continue building right into the marsh line, building right into the ocean, why we need setbacks, why we need buffers. We want to keep the water healthy. We want to keep us healthy. We want to keep us safe. And then financially, you don't want to be penny wise and pound foolish. Why would you continue to build in areas that we can already project would have this level of flooding? You see? And that's what moderate. We didn't do the other extremes that are in the tool, but anybody who wants to can. So tell me about that with the real estate portion, because when you were showing us the chart as well as the fact sheet and what's important to us, you have a certain area in there that actually gives dollar amounts. That oh, actually right. Said, yeah. So it actually uh, tells us in dollar amounts the things that are affected there right here property values so property value yep yeah. so we use a um we use a, a it's a, it's an older epa study but uh but it's um let's see it's giving you the analysis it tallies property value in 2012 dollars on land lower than the selected water level based on property value totals by census block group and so, so right back uh, to the census yeah yeah it's 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 um you know a rough estimate of the land of uh, property that could be uh, at, risk. at risk and as, as new data sets and we we actually recently um, partnered with Zillow to do a, a, a study with them and, and here we go actually uh, we have some modules in some locations so you can actually look at things like homes number of homes at risk mm -hmm. uh, be, based on uh, Zillow data and our analysis on top of it yeah and I thought that was so critical, especially to people who already own homes here and you may be trying to assess net worth and you want to look at, well, is that going to be better in the future, less in the future? 
you might want to examine this to see what's the risk to that property. You know, where is it located? And then how many other properties near you are also at risk? You can figure out how many people near you are also at risk. And so I really love these tools. But tell us a little bit about, like we're looking at maps here, we're looking at PDFs here. What yep. about what we opened up this broadcast with? That mm -hmm. is a different kind of tool. And I know you also have sliders and other things. What about those tools and how can those be used or incorporated with the ones you're showing us? So we do have some flyover videos uh, that visualize, um, you know, in three dimensions, what a, a flood of a certain level could look like. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, that's one way. I've actually talked to a number of um, government officials and planners who um, uh, have utilized these visuals to get their own staff kind of motivated to achieve a certain goal, but also to communicate to their own stakeholders about the, the risk that's out there. Um, you know, what does it mean to be living in a certain area? What could happen? And so uh, we've seen these flyovers used by a number of uh, uh, groups across the country uh, to communicate this risk in a very visual, visual way. In a more dramatic way, like I was saying as well when people see the film footage and things moving on its own, it, it just incites something different than looking at maps. Because I know that there are a lot of people I've met who tell me they used to be lost all the time. They thank God for GPS because they can't read a map. But I'm the person who has a GPS in the car and still have printed maps, right? You know, and so here it is that that involvement, that excitement, that visual effect that comes also with those flyovers, I think means so much to a lot of folks. But where would people find, I know you have this slider feature. Since we've been looking at the different ones, would people find the slider feature that I'm mentioning in Risk Finder or would they find yeah. There, so, uh, asserting so if you go to C, if you go to climatecentral.org, you can link to most of these tools from there. You can, mm -hmm. Actually, what I recommend is you click the Maps button at the top, and it lists all of the tools that we're, we're talking about here. So climatecentral.org is a good place to start. In terms of the, uh, the, the, the sliders, we have the flyover videos and the images here. I'll, I'll open them up. You can click on Mapping Choices, and I'll show you these images that I think you were talking about where we have iconic locations uh, and we're showing, uh, it's not loading here. What we're doing is showing, um, oh, here we go. That's, that's what the tool said, it's too hot to be working. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, my air conditioning is out today, so it's an interesting no. experience, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that's off topic. But here, the, these image, these sliders here are um, uh, communicating what, you know, different flood levels that occur in the future. And these are actually occurring, that th these are actually communicating what flood levels of much higher levels could occur if we were to reach, if the world were to warm two degrees Celsius or two degrees, uh, four degrees. Yeah. Uh, eventually and how much sea levels could rise? How much are we locking in essentially, yeah. right? And Which gives us a choice. The world. And these are for all over yeah. the world versus mm -hmm. the risk finder tool works just in the United States, correct? That's right. Risk finders for the United States. However, this, Coastal, this, this tool is global as well. And the coastal climate, our, yeah, yeah, got yeah. you. So this one here, coastalclimatecentral.org, the maps yeah. are global, but when we so do could, the risk finder tool, that's just for the US. That's right. Okay. So you could look at Bangkok. I, I'm getting off topic, but I can show you in a second. But we do have some US locations for, for, for these sliders. And see, I'm glad you came back to the slide of New York City. Like I was sure. saying to people, if anybody has ever been to Charleston, but many people have visited New York that watch my shows or live in New York that watch my shows, y'all see what that is, right? Go ahead and slide it all the way over, Dan, to our left so that they see. Now look at this. And now you see, y'all see what that is. Wall Street, right? <laughs> y'all are used to seeing that statue, but look what could happen. And that's the how many of, feet of water, that's, that's after, after a four degree Celsius of warming that we could yeah. have Wall Street instead turn to become like River Street. And Whereas River if Street we're able to, yeah. Yeah, and River Street in Charleston last week was River Street for real, the people driving through the water again. And you said until, unless we do what, Dan? 
if we can reduce our emissions, we reduce the risk and the likelihood, we reduce the likelihood that this flooding could occur and we can keep the land dry. So we're trying to communicate the, uh, the two futures we're looking at that, that, that we still have control over, right? Yes. Absolutely. So that one of my colleagues said something, said something I really like. So these tools give you the options to really go in there and see how bad it could get, right? But they yeah. also give you a chance to, it's, it's empowering, she says it's empowering to know that you know, you can look at different futures and we still have a chance to, to, to determine which, which path we're on. And I, right. I liked how she was viewing it that way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's true. We can view how much land we could save, how many people that living on land could be potentially protected if we can, it's based on what humans do in the next, you know, yeah. a, a few, couple decades. Right. And what, um, what I love about your tool is I know I've been in a lot of meetings and I get a lot of tweets where people are always talking about, like you said, that 100 year flood. And so people kind of zone out when they hear 100 years because a lot of people don't expect to live to be 100 years old, much less live for another, you know, because they're always yeah. thinking, well, you mean another 100 years from now? So they're kind of like, oh, yeah, whatever. Why would I care? I'm not going to be here, you know, but we need to care because our children's children's children will be here, God willing. And so we want to make sure that our behavior is not leaving them to suffer. Like you said, if we can change our use and change from all these emissions, but change to cleaner, renewable energy sources, that helps dramatically. The coronavirus, we all saw actually had a silver lining in the cloud of the coronavirus because people stayed away from all the traveling weren't doing all this driving, weren't doing all these flights and things that create higher emissions out there. And we immediately saw waters clearing up. We immediately saw places where vegetation was growing back and the animals took over. It was wonderful seeing the animals take over parks and other places and seeing them swimming through the water in Venice and all of that. And so if we really saw this living example, we've lived through this example of what happened just after a month of human beings not being outside misbehaving. All right. And as I would say, being no manners and thing like that, your mom ain't raised you right. If we were to go back out with new attitudes about how we want to live, how we treat the environment, how we treat the earth, look at how much healing could come. And we wouldn't have to see all this red, you know, we wouldn't have to see all this red in the future, God willing. So now what other goodies you got in the toolkit? <laughs> well, these aren't, it's not ready yet, but Climate Central is working on developing a uh, uh, kind of another level of photorealistic imagery uh, oh, yes. that will look at uh, kind of more localized locations. So stay tuned. Oh, I'll show, I'll, uh, that's coming soon. We have these other flyovers that you're familiar with, right, yes. for global locations. Um, we, uh, we, we've we recently developed a uh, kind of a portfolio analysis tool, which is quite interesting and allows you to uh, kind of uh, look at uh, say you're looking your whole community is at, at risk you want to know the likelihood of uh the the uh, expected number of floods for every home in that community we have a way of doing that we also have a, a global elevation data set um called coastal dam that we're utilizing in our in our global tool actually to show you this really quickly if you okay. search for bangkok oh, tile oh you okay, got to go now. okay dan now you've been hanging around me too long <laughs> because coastal dam Coastal them, y'all name the thing. Coastal <laughs> them, how you do that? <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, yeah. It's probably well, for demographics, it, right? It's probably for demographics, but it does sound like island yeah. talk. <laughs> yeah, it's a digital elevation model, and what we, what our scientists did was we, we used machine learning to um, improve uh, the global elevation data set that NASA had created using satellites, and oh, so uh, a lot of those that satellite elevation. Um, Kind of av average in treetops and building tops so the land we actually thought the land was higher than it was oh, and so this there's an additional tool if you go to click first of all you can click this year tools where we were and if you want to look Back at, at coastalclimatecentral.org yeah. right mm -hmm. and if you want to go to this coastal dem tool you click elevation data set and you can actually toggle between um kind of what where we thought the land was before our our, our new elevation data set and where we now it think went. it's much lower than we thought, about you know, ah. two meters on average. So that's available globally. 
what else might be available kind of more, more useful potentially for those in the US is this water level tool. So it's the same tool, mm -hmm. but you can, um, where should I go? Is there another, another location you're interested in seeing? Let's say Jacksonville, Florida. Let's try that okay. one. So you can come in here, search for your location and, and you can just simply choose a water level and see what land is below that water level. Mm -hmm. So that could be applied to a storm. Like, let's say you're expecting a storm that could come in with a surge of six or seven feet. You could right. come in here and, and just uh, toggle the feet and then go up to, you know, 6.5 feet or whatever. Right. Um, and that's beneficial if somebody's at home and they're trying to really figure out, should I evacuate or shouldn't I? You know, what should we do? And if they were to toggle that, like you said, if they got a weather report that said there's a potential for a five foot flood, you know, and they wanted to see what their neighborhood would look like, this could be something that could better inform that decision as well, don't you think? Yeah, uh, it's a screening level tool. Yeah, I, I agree. And you can look at the broader area, see what's at risk. Sometimes there are certain uh, facilities or areas that are protected, but the roads into them and out of them are will be inundated, are which going to be inundated kind of with water. Leave them isolated. Yeah. Right. And you haven't yet done a flyover for Jacksonville, Florida, right? We've not. And it's our hope that we're able to develop technology to be able to do far more of these. I've said that before, but we're still on it. Still working uh, on it. Still yeah. working on it. I mean, but when you talk about all these data sets and all of these pieces, it's a lot. That's a lot to put in there. So definitely, well, let's unshare your screen okay. and let's yeah. share a little bit of time here with the folks that did come out, come hang out today. We've answered some of the questions, but if any of you that are here participating today have some more questions, drop them right there in the chat and we'll definitely go ahead and hit those up in the last few minutes. But we definitely wanna encourage you again, follow us at gullahgeechination.com and you hear us talking about the Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank, the various activities that we're still doing coronavirus has not stopped us from doing our work to sustain this cultural community. You'll see that we'll blog about it. We'll post about it there. You can follow at Gullah Geechee on Twitter, at Gullah Geechee on Instagram. Gullah is G-U-L-L-A-H. Geechee is G-E-E-C-H-E-E. -E -E -E. Ain't there no I in Geechee if it a we. All right. So Gullah Geechee Nation.com, Gullah Geechee on Twitter and Instagram, and Gullah Geechee Nation on Facebook. So a lot of people follow our fan page and we post fun stuff like the flyover that you did see of Charleston. And so as these other ones come out between Jacksonville and Jacksonville, we'll be posting those, we'll be sharing those, and we'll be reblogging and tweeting about them. So we have a number of different fun things. When we do a session, people tend to go away from our session saying they enjoyed it. Um, not just that it was, oh, it was so much, I don't remember, you know, and at least we want to give them tools that they can take home. So it's so important that y'all have all these links that we've given out today. So riskfinder.org, coastal.climatecentral.org, sealevel.climatecentral.org is a great place to start off, and that can link you to the various other tools. And so one of the things that one of our other Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank partners asked about is he asked, have these tools been used by high school age youth? And also have they been used for community engagement around the sea level rise risk? And I can tell you that for the community engagement in the Gullah Geechee community, yes, I have used them here for different meetings with Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition members, the Gullah Geechee Fishing Association, and Dan has also presented and others from Climate Central have presented at our annual Coastal Cultures Conference. And we've used them to engage with community members and college students. Now, I haven't yet used them with high school. Dan, have you? I haven't personally, but we see a, a, a frequently folks from high school, whether it's teachers or students, downloading our materials and telling us how they plan to use it uh, in their, either in their curriculum or uh, to, for a homework assignment. So we see that use in, in, in the downloads. So that's wonderful. So basically when people are using your data, downloading your data, you're doing more data collection. Yeah, there's an optional way they can tell us who they are and how they plan to use the materials if they choose to and about you know, a good portion of them do. So it's quite interesting to see kind of the wide range of use from city planners to advocacy groups to um, 
folks, uh, senators, and uh, community leaders in Florida have used it to uh, educate their community and, um, and that kind of thing. Wonderful, wonderful. So now I see some other goodies. I see some wonderful comments coming in um, saying that we're doing a great job. Thanks a lot, Don. I'm glad <laughs> to hear that. And, and glad that Eric, you got your great answer. And then Don also mentioned this, who works over with you as well, that many counties and city planners from towns who cannot afford expensive tools themselves use this tool because that's something we haven't said. It's free. You all don't have to pay a fee. Like when you get to that site, you're not going to be held at the door like y'all were, unfortunately, I'm sorry today to get in here, but you're not going to be held at the door and then ask for your credit card, you know, or it's a 30 day trial or it's a one week trial like the newspapers are doing to all of us right now where you can't even just access the things. They'll tell you, oh, well, you ran out. You don't have a subscription. You got to go ahead and pay now. No, this is totally free. So you can go ahead and you can use the tool even when you download the PDFs. There's no charge. And so that's another reason why I love this tool and I love being able to tell my, not just my community, the Gullah Geechee's about it, but communities everywhere I go. I always talk about it and tout this tool. And so even the sections that now about international work, I want to take that into the work that I'm doing with a lot of people on the UN level that are fighting to protect heritage. So making sure that cultural heritage is a part of the climate change discussion and dialogue. And so it is so wonderful to have an opportunity to do the things that we do here for keep we write you and thing like that edit put all and thing like that edit but then for do this y'all okay so for me to also have a chance to do this the scientific work that i love just as, almost as much as i love the cultural work you know and so this is a great thing so dan if there was anything that you would say to someone that said well i love this i loved watching it where do I start? Where would you send them first if they've never used a tool like this before and they're just excited by watching this interview now and they want to do it? Which one of those links would you tell them to start off with and what might you tell them to do first? Yeah, so I would recommend going to uh, coastal.climatecentral.org, type your location, coastal location in the top right, search for it. You can zoom in and pan. And then you can download a map image if you wanted to share it with your colleagues by email or print it out. Uh, and if you have any questions, email us at sea level at climatecentral.org. We'd be happy to, uh, to uh, get back to you with any questions you have. Yeah, that's great. So y'all got that? Sea level at climatecentral.org. That's kind of an easy email address. I love it. And uh, I've used it, of course, over the years, and it's been wonderful because they ended up enlisting me to really be like a beta tester. Uh, so I've enjoyed right, We've gotten a lot of useful feedback. Thanks so much for that. Yeah, it's so much fun. And I'm looking forward to even the other ones that are coming up in the future that I've gotten to see a few little things buzzing about, um, about them. And so I'm looking forward to those getting out here for the public too. And tell us this, if they go to your website, is there a place on there where people can sign up so that they'll know when you have other tools or do they just have to keep checking back in hmm. the page? Yeah, if they go to clevel.climatecentral.org, at the bottom, you can sign up for our newsletter and we'll uh, include you in any update update alerts we send out when we release new studies or tools. Excellent, excellent. So they can stay tuned. And of course, you heard at the beginning, all right, that this group, Climate Central, with all the science they're doing, they're actually a nonprofit organization. So I'm sure they don't mind any of you who are watching that want to write a very big check to some work to keep their work going, I'm sure they would not be insulted at all, you know, um, if you would do that. And we have some other things that we are working on and we are definitely happy to be able to partner with Climate Central in educating the community and educating the world on how important it is that we do focus on this aspect of the climate science, the sea level rises. And I think with these tools, it helps that many more people to really dig into it or to get on out here and roll with us, you know, down the stream as we look at things that we can change for the better 
All right. So definitely, Dan, I appreciate you so much and the whole team that's over there working with you, backing you up, that's back there dealing with the zeros and the ones um, at Climate Central. Yeah. And I'm so happy that everybody's healthy. I pray that y'all continue to stay safe, stay healthy and everything and keep on making some great tools. Any final words for the audience today? Just thank you for your interest and, and thanks for, for uh, I've really appreciated your partnering with you and collaborating with you, Queen Quentin. We, re we really look forward to the next phases of, of work. Yes. And, uh, yes. And we hope that our tools are useful to everyone. So don't, don't hesitate to reach out. We'd love to hear from you and uh, keep, stay tuned for additional tools from Climate Central. Absolutely. And so we're going to keep centralizing this discussion and zooming in on sustainability. I'm Queen Quet, Chief and Head of State for the Gullah Geechee Nation. You can always find me at queenquet.com. Quet is Q-U-E-T. You can also, again, follow the Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition that helps sponsor this broadcast. Go to Gullah Geechee dot net gullagichi dot net and you can email us once again the email is g u l l g e e c o at aol.com and we'll add you to our database and so we also have an ongoing fundraiser to protect this land and that's part of why we do this work we cannot sustain Gullah Geechee culture without sustaining our land and sustaining that land ownership in the hands of Gullah Geechees so you can always send a donation to dollar sign Gullah Geechee Nation dollar sign Gullah Geechee Nation if you use cash app and you can also go to GoFundMe and you'll see the Gullah Geechee Land Legacy Fund. And part of the funds we use is to fight legal battles to protect this land. And fortunately, right before I came on the air, I got an email from one of our Gullah Geechee, said, used to be one of our Gullah Geechee sustainability partners, but she's retired now. And she sent me the article that's in today's newspaper showing that the governor of South Carolina made it clear that he is supporting Queen Quet and the Gullah Geechee Nation to keep our culture alive and stopping destruction at this place called Bay Point. And so Bay Point is right off St. Helena Island, looks very similar to what you see behind me and where that is a fishing ground for us. And so we wanna protect that area. We wanna protect the natural bodies that we have here. So these natural bodies protect our bodies. We eat from these waters. We literally sustain ourselves from these waters and off this land. And as I always say, we the Binya and we in the Gwina, we're tall, tall. So if you support us in doing that, please donate dollar sign Gullah Geechee Nation via Cash App and go to GoFundMe look for the Gullah Geechee Land and Legacy Fund. You'll see a video with me there explaining all these things and why that's important. But these kinds of tools that Climate Central has created for us, we are able to use them to go in and argue our point in courtrooms, in these boardrooms, in these places, in these spaces where these elected officials make decisions about who they resource, what they resource, and where they resource. And so we thank you because we know as humans, you are the most valuable resource and we're all in this together. So if anything is gonna rise up, let it be us. People who are righteous and people who want the place to be better for everybody. So let's make that our central point of discussion as we even move around and use these climate central tools and you make this something you want to zoom in on so we keep this place sustainable so thank you thank you to all the hunter children who joined we we so glad that hunter been here for this your journey for zooming in on sustainability peace and blessings stay safe and healthy everybody